Welcome everybody to the Charleston Library Society Zoom. Um, I can't ask how many people have not been here before, but uh, I think we have some new people. I know I can say that Cindy Fanter is supposed to be in on this Zoom because she's the friend who recommended and passed on from, she's a good friend in Des Moines, she passed on the piece that I used in last week's letter about keeping things in perspective if you were born in 1900. And I sent that on to her thinking that she deserved a shout out for giving me such a wonderful way to introduce my weekly letter. And she saw the write up about Jerry and immediately signed up for it. So I hope that she will come into this mix. But it's wonderful to have everybody here Jerry Mitchell gave this talk on wine and books about four years ago. And I was blown away as anybody who knows Jerry is. He's brilliant, charming, fun, um, and incredibly articulate. And he had done so much research on such a broad basis about how wine is of interest, whether it was in a cookbook or in poetry or uh, some really nasty wine crit critic. It, it just was all encompassing. And <clears throat> I don't know about the rest of you, but I've found that I'm drinking more wine since we began this pandemic. And so Dutch and I started uh, appealing to Jerry to please reprise his discussion about wine and books, which are close to my heart. So I'm going to turn it over, introduce you to our dear friend and president of the Board of Trustees, Jerry Mitchell. Thank you, Anne, for the generous introduction. And thank you, listeners and watchers on Zoom, for sharing part of your afternoon with the Library Society. So let's begin by talking about collecting. Great book collections are intentional. They emphasize the rare, the important, the beautiful. Great book collections are the result of a planned and deliberate collaboration between collector, scholar, and dealer. Great book collections are disciplined. Then there are other collections, modest collections, accidental collections, undisciplined collections, collections that just seem to happen. I first realized that I had a collection of books on wine when my wife and I decided to have a new bookcase built, seven feet by 14 feet, against a living room wall. As I carried books from various nooks and crannies to their new home, I recognized that my wine books alone would take up all the space and more. There were well over a thousand of them, some obscure, but most common, some quite valuable, but most eminently affordable some groundbreaking in their conclusions, but most not especially original. And yet it was a collection. Wine books deal with obvious subjects such as connoisseurship and history, studies of the great chateau and great winemakers, grape varieties, winemaking chemistry, primers and introductions for the novice, and of course, tasting notes. There are large, thick coffee table sized books meant to impress your friends with striking photographs of a French vineyard at sunrise or the perfect glass of Cabernet set on a rustic table somewhere in Napa. Less common subjects are philosophy and wine, religion and wine, art and wine, books of wine humor, wine as it pertains to health and medicine, women and wine, the economics of wine, investing in wine, and books dealing with 
corks, corkscrews, glasses, decanters, and wine labels. There are also books on unexpected subjects, wine snobbery, wine crossword puzzles, wine murder mysteries, wine graphic novels, and even wine books for little children. The earliest scholarly bibliography dealing with wine is Andre Simon's Biblioteca Venaria of 1913. Its first entry is Cato's Libri de Re Rustica in a 1533 edition. The foremost English language wine book bibliographer today is James Gabler, whose first edition of Wine into Words, a history and bibliography of wine books in the English language was published in 1985. A second edition was published in 2003 with 7,800 entries. It is the bibliography with such wonderful, amusing annotations that you can actually read it cover to cover without dozing off. No discussion about wine writing and wine books can begin without a deep bow to Andre Simon. He wrote over 100 books and pamphlets on wine. His knowledge of wine was encyclopedic and his literary style imaginative, clear, concise, and distinctive. His first book, The History of the Champagne Trade in England, was privately printed in 1905 and his last, In the Twilight, was published in 1969. Simone's reputation as a judge of wine was unassailable. A story is told of him, probably dating to the 1930s, in which a group of wine merchants decided to test his tasting capacity. He was given a succession of glasses of different wines, and he was asked to say, literally blindfolded, what each wine was. He sampled each one in turn, and after a moment's reflection, he named the exact wine and the exact vintage. Finally, his hosts offered him, still blindfolded, a glass of water. This gave him pause. He rolled it round the glass, sniffed, and tasted. At length, he gave his verdict. I don't know what it is, he said. I doubt if I ever tasted it before. But I can tell you one thing, it won't sell. Simone was a dedicated bibliophile whose wine book collection was one of the finest ever assembled by an individual. It was sold by Sotheby's in 1981. Among his treasures was the 1568 edition of Dr. William Turner's A New Book on the Natures and Properties of All Wines that Are Commonly Used in England. This was the first book in English to deal with wine. Simon enjoyed drinking as much as he enjoyed writing and believed that a man dies too young if he leaves any wine in his cellar. And in keeping with that philosophy, only two magnums of claret remained in his personal cellar when he died at the age of 93. Writing about wine, creating prose to describe how a wine tastes to an author and how it might taste to a reader is a challenge. Galileo Galilei, the Italian astronomer, physicist, and philosopher, wrote in his, in his 1623 book, Il Saggiatore, that a wine's good taste does not belong to objective determination, but to the special character of the subject enjoying the taste. Yet Galileo couldn't resist trying his hand at wine description anyway, and he concluded in the same book that wine tasted like sunlight held together by water. Sunlight held together by water. Writing in the 20th century, Ellen McCoy admits that in describing wine, there's often a fine line between sensible and silly. 
saying that a sip of a delicious young Mosul is like biting into a tart, juicy apple certainly characterizes the wine better than merely stating that it has a high level of malic acid. But this approach can easily be overdone. Aubryn Waugh, son of the British novelist Evelyn Waugh, of whom more later, would disagree with McCoy about the pitfalls of overdoing taste descriptions. Aubryn Waugh wrote columns for several newspapers and magazines, and in his book, Waugh on Wine, he declares that good wine writing should be camped up. The writer should never like a wine. He should be in love with it. Never find a wine disappointing, but identify it as a mortal enemy and attempt to poison him. Sulfuric acid should be discovered where there is the faintest hint of sharpness. Bizarre and improbable side taste should be proclaimed. Mushrooms, rotting wood, black treacle, burned pencils, condensed milk, sewage, the smell of French railway stations. Waugh almost lost his job over one description of a disagreeable wine when he compared it to a dead chrysanthemum on the grave of a stillborn baby. This understandably offended a young midwife who reported him to the British Press Council and only the support of his then editor, Tina Brown, got him off. But one need not go as far as Waugh to agree that creative similes and metaphors are useful and abound in wine writing. One reason why taste descriptions are such a trial to the wine writer is that, as Lawrence Osborne notes, for all the subtleties which human taste is capable of, we can actually only taste four elementary things, sweetness, sourness, saltiness, and bitterness. And some would add a fifth taste known to the Japanese as umami, or savory. So if there are only four or five tastes, shouldn't all wine writers agree about taste description? Of course not. In her excellent book, Wines of the Grave, Pamela Van Dyke Price compares a number of recognized writers' attempts to describe what wines of the Grave should taste like. Here are some of them. H. Warner Allen declares that Grave have a certain austere majesty in their finesse, but lack an indefinable delicacy of charm. Alexis Lachine sees body, a distinct character of earthiness. Jancis Robinson finds them stony and sandy. Michael Broadbent is reminded of butter and lanolin. Oz Clark bemoans an indistinct dry backbone to the fruit, which stops them from being razor sharp. Stephen Spurrier observes clean, dense fruit. Robert Parker notes a rich, earthy, almost tobacco-scented character. Take your choice. All describe wines of the Grave. All are written by experts. All are different and some even contradictory. To state the obvious, wine descriptions are highly personal and highly subjective. Who we are, how much we know, how inventive and imaginative a vocabulary we possess, what tastes we like, and what tastes we find unpleasant all contribute how we might describe a wine. Robinson comments that there will always be as many opinions of a wine as there are tasters of it, and sometimes even more than that. Wine writing and wine tasting are tricky businesses. Ernest Gallo, the marketing genius behind E&J Gallo Wines, the world's largest family-owned winery, tried to simplify things by saying in an oral history, I simply judge a wine by pouring a glass of it and drinking it. If I feel like another glass, to me it's a good wine. As to the challenges of identifying the origins of a particular wine, it is worth repeating the old story about an unnamed wine expert who was asked when he last mistook 
a Bordeaux for a Burgundy. Oh, he replies, not since lunch. Robert M. Parker Jr., creator of the newsletter, The Wine Advocate, and the author of some 14 books about wine, deserves more than passing mention in any talk on contemporary wine reading and wine writing. He is the promulgator of the 100 point wine rating system. If a wine gets a 90 plus score from the newsletter, increased sales are sure to follow, and a 98 or 99 could secure a vineyard's reputation for years to come. Parker's biographer notes that to his fans, he is a combination of Julia Child and Ralph Nader, and to his enemies, a self-appointed wine judge bent on reducing the deep, complex meaning of wine to a two-digit number. Parker, whose nose is insured for over $1 million and who has reportedly tasted 150 wines at a single go, has a preference for big, rich, high-alcohol wines and an equally exaggerated writing style that leans heavily on exclamation points and grand pronouncements. Wines that he likes are invariably described as opulent, chewy, ripe, viscous, big, and breathtaking. Parker's vocabulary and his preference for so-called big wines has led one critic, Kermit Lynch, to remark that rejecting a wine because it is not big enough is like rejecting a book because it's not long enough or a piece of music because it's not loud enough. Eric Asimov in his book, How to Love Wine, joins the anti-numerical rating crowd, arguing that short of detecting whether a wine is spoiled or not, wine tasting does not lend itself to dispassionate evaluation. Ratings create the illusion of certainty where there is none. But back to Parker, his ability to taste and distinguish several dozen wines at a sitting leads to the question of whether the experience of a specialist writer who tastes in laboratory conditions and spits out what he is tasting is at all relevant to the experience of an amateur reader who at a convivial dinner with agreeable company and soft candlelight drinks one glass of wine or perhaps two or three or dare I say it four and swallows it. Wine after all does contain alcohol. It is intoxicating and drinking it has an effect. Ah yes, wine does contain alcohol and drinking it has an effect. One is reminded of the memorable scene in Evelyn Waugh's great novel, Brideshead Revisited, in which the protagonists, Charles and Sebastian, explore Brideshead Castle's wine cellar. Permit me to read the passage. Sebastian had found a book on wine tasting and we followed it in detail. We warmed the glass slightly at a candle, filled a third of it, swirled the wine round, nursed it in our hands, held it over the light, breathed it, sipped it, filled our mouths with it, and rolled it over the tongue, wringing it on the palate like a coin on a counter, tilted our heads back, and let it trickle down the throat. Then we talked of it and nibbled Bath Oliver biscuits and passed on to another wine, then back to the first, then to another until all were in circulation and the order of the glasses got confused and we fell over which was which and we passed the glasses to and fro between us. And there were six glasses, some of the mixed wines in them, which we had filled from the wrong bottle till we were obliged to start all over again with clean glasses and the bottles were empty and our praise of the wines became wilder and more exotic. It is a shy wine like a gazelle, like a leprechaun, like a flute 
by still water, like a prophet in a cave, like the last unicorn. If I were asked about preferences in modern wine rating, writing, I would cite the late Cyril Ray and the very much living Jay McInerney as the most fun to read, Hugh Johnson and Jancis Robinson as the most complete, knowledgeable, and literate, and Michael Broadbent and the American writers Dorothy Gator and John Brecker, husband and wife, as the most useful. Cyril Ray was a journalist for the Manchester Guardian and then the London Times. He was decorated in World War II, covered Stalin's Russia for the BBC, and in midlife turned from reporting about foreign affairs to writing about wine. He wrote books about cognac and Italian wines, Chateau Lafitte and Bollinger Champagne, but most importantly, he was responsible for the complete imbiber series of books which ran to 16 volumes and contained essays, stories, and humorous asides about wine, food, and the good life. A typical number of the complete imbiber might contain contributions from writers as varied as Anton Chekhov, G.K. Chesterton, Isaac Dennison, Iris Murdoch, John Mortimer, and of course, Cyril Ray himself. Ray's goal in writing about wine was to please, not to pontificate, and he usually succeeded. He was a socialist who sent his son to Eton, a connoisseur of fine wines who liked nothing better than a glass of Guinness, a loather of warmongering with a passion for regimental histories. Perhaps this bundle of contradictions made him the witty, engaging wine writer and discerning editor that he was. Jay McInerney, the author of the bestseller Bright Lights, Big City, is now the town and country magazine wine columnist following a stint at the Wall Street Journal, and he's written three wine books. He sprinkles his writing with copious name dropping and sly comments about the social scene and society's great, near great, and hangers on. In describing the difference between Lafitte Rothschild and Mouton Rothschild, he writes that Lafitte is fragrant and ethereal, Mouton loud and flashy. Lafitte is Leonardo to Mouton's Michelangelo. If they made clothes, Lafitte would be Armani and Mouton Versace. Here's McInerney on Italy's Suave region. The view from the exit ramp of the autostrada is emblematic of the problem with Suave. The first thing you see through your windshield is a huge lime green warehouse with a bat wing roof line that looks like some sort of retro futuristic vision from the animators of the Powerpuff Girls. They ought to post a caveat emptor sign beside the exit. He deems Suave to be the insipid white, white beverage of our ignorant youth and a reservoir of cheap mouthwash. McInerney's smirky chapter headings such as Pinot Envy and Zin Went the Strings of My Heart are examples of the sort of bad college humor that still makes you chuckle. One may differ with McInerney's taste, I do, but he's a good writer and his books are fun to read. McInerney traces his own interest in wine to Ernest Hemingway. He writes that it all began with Hemingway, as so many things do, specifically with The Sun Also Rises, because part of what McInerney carried away from that book in his youth was the sense that drinking wine was elegant and meaningful and sophisticated. Wine is one of the most civilized things in the world, Hemingway wrote in Death in the Afternoon, and one of the natural things of the world that has been brought to the greatest perfection, and it offers a greater range for enjoyment and appreciation than possibly any purely sensory thing. Not Hemingway's greatest prose, perhaps, 
but it impressed McInerney at the time. Hugh Johnson, who has written 28 books on wine, and Jancis Robinson, who has 23 to her credit, including the essential Oxford Companion to Wine, write elegantly and with authority on all aspects of the beverage. Both have received every award and won every prize offered for wine writing. Robinson's Tasting Pleasures, Confessions of a Wine Lover, written in 1997, is a charming autobiography that illustrates her belief that the whole point of wine is to give pleasure, as much of it to as many people as possible. I agree with that belief and with Robinson's strongly held concern that contemporary wine writers, particularly some Americans, have become too serious, too exacting, too professional. The old timers, like the British writer John Arlott, who is as well known for his commentary on cricket as for his books on wine, and Derek Cooper, whose tastes ran more to whiskey than to wine, these old timers may have been short on enological science, but they made up for it with delightful, engaging style. Hugh Johnson's A Life Uncorked, published in 2005, is similarly autobiographical, advancing Johnson's view that wine is more than a drink and that its characteristics link it directly to memory, topography, and the places where we consume it. Johnson's The World Atlas of Wine, a landmark study of the geography of wine, contains some 143 full color maps and took him eight years to write. Johnson likes to describe wines in musical terms, observing harmony or discord, how a wine starts, develops, lingers, and finishes, how it has volume and internal balance, how it organizes its energy, how it carries a message. Johnson is a bit of an anti-Parker, arguing that judgments based on decibels and volume alone run the risk of mistaking loudness for quality. He would no more give wines a numerical rating than he would rate, say, La Boheme, an 87, and Don Giovanni, a 99. Gator and Brecker, like McInerney, and he used to write for the Wall Street Journal, but they left that paper, and I miss their homespun approach. I like them because their columns and three books are about wines you can actually buy at prices you can actually afford, not cult wines that never leave California, French garagiste limited releases, or Bordeaux from the age of Thomas Jefferson. And they rarely obsess about vintages, basically arguing that, hey, if you like Geyser Peak Sauvignon Blanc 2016, you'll probably like the 2017 and the 2018 as well. If Gator and Brecker are useful because they write about wines we can all buy and drink, Michael Broadbent's books are useful because he describes truly spectacular wines which we may never be able to try. Broadbent spent a quarter of a century at Christie's as a fine wine auctioneer, and his massive published collection of tasting notes testify to his endless curiosity about wine. If, for instance, we wonder what a 1928 Chateau Latour might taste like, Broadbent is our man. He tasted it first in 1953, then in the 70s, then again in the 80s, and finally in the 1990s when he found it intensely deep, spicy, cinnamon, cedary bouquet, surprisingly sweet and velvety despite its tannin, masculine, with great concentration and length. Broadbent gives vicarious pleasure. We might picture ourselves standing beside him, no doubt in evening dress, sipping the last of that glorious 28 Latour. So thus far, we've talked about the mainstream of wine writing, wine tasting, and 
wine appreciation. So now let's leave the mainstream and dip into the eddies, where we will encounter some less familiar wine book types. Harry Ayers has been called one of the most eloquent representatives of the worldwide slow movement, which seeks to encourage the thoughtful, slow enjoyment and profound pleasures and values that make life worth living. He is a classicist who has written three books which touch on wine, including his latest, Horace and Me, Life Lessons from an Ancient Poet. Ayers writes that wine was my first strong link with the Roman poet Horace, for when Horace writes about bringing out a special jar from the cellar, I didn't need any scholarly explanation. I understood him in my bones. Horace's ode, Vile Potabis, dating to 23 BC, is one of my favorites. I'll read it and then give you Ayers' rather idiosyncratic translation. The poet Horace is addressing his wealthy patron, the Roman statesman Mycenas. Vile potabis modicis sabinum catarsis, greca quodigo ipse testa conditum levi, datus in teatro cum tibi plausus, care masinus equus, et paterni fluminis ripe, simu et iucosa rederat laudis tipi vaticani motis imago, cassibum et prelo dominum caleno, tu bibis uvum, mea nec falerni temperent, Vitis neque formiani ocula coles. The translation, just the basic plonk in standard tumblers. The local Sabine wine is what you'll get from me, my sanus, but my own, a jar of home brew I laid up and sealed the day, my friend, when you had your triumph. When the applause was thunderous, grateful Romans acknowledging what you'd done the happy echo ringing round seven hills. Then you drink the best Brunello without doubt. But as I say, you'll get no Grand Cru here, just what I grow in my own shady valley, here in the corner that you blessed me with. Horace knew something that wine snobs often forget, that friendship and warmth count for more in the end than the label on the bottle. In the field of medicine, Professor Serge Renaud's article in The Lancet on the French paradox in which red wine is shown to reduce cholesterol has won him much acclaim, but it is Salvatore Lucia, MD, who wins the prize for quantity, if not for quality of output. He has written scores of scientific papers and books with titles such as Wine and the Digestive System and A History of Wine as Therapy. Lucia maintains that wine will cure all physical ills and comfort all mental anxieties. Marjorie Michaels in Stay Healthy with Wine recommends specific wines, some mixed with everything from onions to apples, to treat arthritis, diabetes, and even athlete's foot. There is a champagne cure for the common cold. Two self-proclaimed prominent California physicians, David Witten and Martin Lipp, share their research findings in a book titled To Your Health, that no other food or beverage has ever been found to be more effective than wine in extending longevity. Ted Goldfinger, board certified in cardiology and internal medicine, points out in his books that wine drinking is not associated with weight gain and that wine drinkers are leaner than the general populace. Roger Corder in The Red Wine Diet argues that wine drinkers are less prone to heart disease and dementia than non-wine drinkers. And Gene Ford, another writer on the medicinal benefits of wine, cites multiple peer-reviewed papers to buttress his claim that wine intake among the elderly improves both continence and cognitive performance. 
something, of course, that members of the Charleston Library Society have known for 272 years. Perhaps, and only perhaps, an investigator in some obscure laboratory will soon discover that COVID-19 too can be cured by wine, but my fear is that wine will then disappear from market shelves as quickly as toilet paper and hand sanitizer. In 1974, Eunice Freed, in her book, Whatever Every Woman Should Know About Wine, complained that wine was still a man's game. 46 years later, this is hardly the case. In fact, one might argue that wine is becoming a woman's game. Women are vineyard owners, growers, winemakers, wine writers, enologists, sommeliers, merchants, tasters, drinkers, Yes, wine book collectors. If I were to read the names of just some of the women prominent in the world of wine, it might sound something like this. Balbo Barrett, Belair, Bees, Leroy, Brown, Cahar, Cullen, Curran, Druin, Edwards, Fale, Formeau, Gallo, G, Gallo, S, Hanley, Hunter, Long, Marnier, La Postole, de Bournay, Benzelopoulos, Meredith, Miyamura, Moschetti, Nichols, Nicholson, Noble, Ostrov, Price, Putnam, Ricard, Robinson A, Robinson J, Rothschilds, Broco, Severini, Spillat, Sutcliffe, Turley, Unseman, Villers, and Zola. And this selective list does not include women who have written personal memoirs or romances, such as Louisa Thomas Hargrave, whose book, The Vineyard, was called A Tale of True Grit, Psychological and Physical by Hugh Johnson, and Linda Kaplan, whose book, My First Crush, is a candid account of her trials and tribulations and attempts to learn not only about wine, but about life. Feminist studies such as Deborah Brenner's Women of the Vine and Anne Mantisar's Women of Wine address women's roles in the wine world without resorting to tiresome gender stereotypes. Another burgeoning category of wine books is wine humor and wine one-liners and wine bon mots. Let's begin with Napoleon, who said, in victory, you deserve champagne. In defeat, you need it. There is the W.C. Fields favorite. What contemptible scoundrel stole the cork from my lunch? And Michael Broadbent's honest comment on blind tasting, a sight of the label is worth 50 years experience. Art Bookwald, late of the Washington Post, wrote, I like champagne because it always tastes as though my foot's asleep. While 007, Ian Fleming's James Bond, proclaims in Goldfinger, my dear girl, there are some things that just aren't done, such as drinking Dom Perignon 53 above the temperature of 38 degrees Fahrenheit. One of my own favorite one-liners is Julia Child's response to the interviewer's question, what is your favorite wine? Without so much as a pause, Julia replied, gin. Then, of course, we have Lord Byron, who wrote, tis a pity wine should be so deleterious, for tea and coffee leave us much more serious. And being serious, if only for a moment, we should Note that philosophy and religion and wine have been linked in literature since ancient times. Fritz, Fritz Alhoff, author of Wine and Philosophy, reminds us that the most overt connection between wine and philosophy lies in the symposia that took place in ancient Greece. These were effectively wine parties that gave rise to profound philosophy conferences. At the University of London and at the meeting of the American Philosophical Association, there have been several wine and philosophy books presented with essays on wine epistemology, wine and metaphysics, wine and aesthetics. As for the great philosophers themselves, we know that the empiricist David Hume liked a good claret, and Immanuel Kant, he of the categorical imperative, preferred the wine of the Canary Islands. Of the many books on wine and religion, 
most cite the Sabbath meal and Judaism and the Christian Eucharist as illustrations of how fully the subtle pleasures of wine drinking are associated with the urge to find union with God. And in the Chinese religious tradition, wine is offered to ancestors and placed on altars in honor of protective deities. Even the Quran, though it prohibits drinking wine here on earth, celebrates it as a reward in paradise. And who can forget the words of Omar Khayyam, the 11th century Persian Sufi Muslim poet who wrote, I often wonder what the vintner buys half as precious as what he sells. You wouldn't think that there would be wine books written for children, but there are. The Grapes Grow Sweet is a story of a young child's first harvest in Napa, illustrated with watercolors. And the Vineyard Book for slightly older children, perhaps 10 to 12, explains how a vineyard is planted, nurtured, and harvested. There are even wine coloring books that come complete with crayons. As for graphic novels, one really shouldn't miss the Japanese comic or manga titled The Drops of God, which was a hit all over Asia, then in France, and now here in the States. The story is well constructed, the drawings are clear, and the wine facts are accurate. There are five volumes in this series which educate as well as amuse the reader as the two protagonists, super tasters both, compete to identify 12 extraordinary wines. Wine mysteries can be conveniently separated into three categories. First, there are true crime books such as Maximilian Potter's Shadows in the Vineyard, which recounts the plot to poison the world's greatest wine, the legendary Domaine de la Romaine Conti. Another equally compelling true crime book is Benjamin Wallace's The Billionaire's Vinegar, the tale of an elaborate and successful wine con game involving one of the Koch brothers and a flamboyant German connoisseur. The second category includes the works of acknowledged masters of the crime category, in which, who just happen to choose a vineyard as a wine theme for the setting of a particular novel. Georges Simonon's Magret and the Wine Merchant and Michael Dibden's Aurelio Zen Mystery, A Long Finish, are two good examples of books in which wine is part of the plot, but not critical to the solving of a crime. Third, there are books in which wine is central and in which there are pages and pages of wine lore and description, in addition to the obligatory three or four corpses. Michelle Scott's Murder Uncorked <clears throat> and David Osborne's Murder in the Napa Valley serve as examples here. Most murders in wine mysteries are committed the usual way. The unfortunate victim is shot, stabbed, or poisoned. But the more creative authors do better than that, opting for beatings with barrel staves, usually French oak, or a hit and run with a vineyard tractor or a small fruit truck. In Murder Uncorked, the heroine, Nikki Sands, is searching for the winemaker at a California vineyard when she stumbles into some bushes. There was the body of a man with thick grapevines pulled tautly around his neck, his brown eyes bulging out of his purplish face. Paula Carter's Red Wine Goes With Murder has the sleuth find the corpse in a vat of Cote de Rhone, while Ellen Crosby, the author of several wine mysteries, prefers a vat of Merlot in both cases leading the reader to wonder whether the victim was drowned or asphyxiated or dispatched even before he was dumped into the vat. Prize for the most gruesome murder goes to David Osborne for placing the body in a stemmer crusher. It took a moment for this to register, Osborne writes in the voice of his sleuth. It took a moment for me to remember the powerful Archimedean screw at the bottom of the big steel hopper. I'd stood and watched it chew ruthlessly in the bunches of grapes, tearing leaves and stalks away as it forced them through the small aperture into the grinding mechanism, which would smash and pulp them into juice. 
I thought of Hester and the same machine caught by the screw, and I suddenly felt sick. Some authors include recipes and wine pairings along with their mystery stories, but after reading about the Stemmer Crusher, most readers will have lost their appetites. So is it possible to find a common theme in the variety of wine books which we have explored? And what of the subjects we have left untouched, such as wine merchandising, miniature wine books, and books on cheap wine, scratch and sniff wine books, and books on wine cellars? Frankly, it is a stretch for me to find an overarching theme, but if I had to do it, I would agree with Frank Pryle, who wrote a wine column for the New York Times and admitted in his book, Wine Talk, that what fascinates me most about the world of wine is the people who inhabit it. And so it is for me. What makes most wine books come alive is not really the discussions of terroir and vintage, microclimate, tannin, cellaring, and auction prices, but the personalities of the authors themselves as expressed through their writing. And all these personalities in their glorious eccentricities are encapsulated in the volumes on the shelves of this wine book collector's library, a library that in the final analysis may prove to be not so accidental at all. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. That was, a, well, <laughs> we can all clap for you. <laughs> it's not like a normal audience, but that was phenomenal once again. Um, just like some good wine, it, it, it ages well, if you will. Um, so everybody, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Megan Mina, who is the sister of our head librarian, Laura Mina. Um, she's a sommelier with 20 plus years uh, experience in the restaurant world. Um, and her most current title is the, um, the wine captain or the sommelier at Zero George. Um, so Megan has some interesting questions that she'll uh, be having a conversation with Jerry with for the next couple minutes. So let's pass it over to Megan. Hello, thank you for the uh, introduction. Um, so I know we don't have too much time, but uh, I do have a couple of, forgive me, but maybe obvious questions that I'd like to um, start off with, if I may. Um, and the first one being, do you collect any other book genres? I mean, obviously we've heard so much about your wine library. Do you have any other collections in your library? I do. I have uh, some author collections, uh, some modern authors uh, such as Lawrence Durrell, who wrote the Alexandra Quartet, uh, Paul Bowles, who uh, wrote a number of books about North Africa. And then I have some older collections, which are more uh, collectible for the volumes themselves rather than for the contents. It's the typography and the binding that are more important in those books than the actual contents. And those are books published by the Aldine Press and by the Elsevier Press. Aldine Press is uh, 16th century uh, Italy and uh, Elsevier Press is 17th century Holland. Wow, that's impressive. That sounds maybe a little less accidental than, than your wine collection. <laughs> yes, that's probably true. <laughs> um, so uh, with that being said, do you have any other collections? perhaps music, wine? I, I do have other book collections and uh, I have some odd collections uh, of objects um, and wine I uh, have collected, but uh, I don't have the proper cellaring for it right now. So my wine collection has probably uh, seen its day. I, I've suffered the same in some of mine, but I think a collection can just be a shelf in your refrigerator when it comes to wine. <laughs> Good for you. I agree. <laughs> uh, so as far as, as your wine cellar, um, whichever, whatever that may be, uh, do you feel like that emulates your collection of wine reading at all? Is it a little bit of everything like you have on the shelves or do you 
feel like it focuses a little more in a region or variety or country? Uh, right now, it's, uh, it's quite varied, but there was a time when I was uh, very uh, concentrated on uh, first growth Bordeaux, and uh, then I was interested in wines from uh, a vineyard in California called Chalone, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that took me in several different directions. But right now, I would say catch as catch can, uh, where <laughs> the taste takes me. I love that. Um, so uh, I guess as we're quarantining, um, this might change a little bit, but uh, I, I'm curious what your go-to wine is for if you're going to open up a bottle for some guests or sit down to dinner with a, a table of friends. Do you have any old standbys or what do you, what do you typically pick out? Well, uh, that's a great question. I would say it depends very much on the guest uh, and, of course, what one is serving. But uh, I think the, the great French wines, first growth Bordeaux, can't be touched. They are my favorites. Uh, but I would only bring them out for very special occasions. Uh, the food has to be right. The people have to be right. And my pocketbook has to be able to afford <laughs> replacing them once they're consumed. Uh, but uh, I would say that uh, a number of the wines from uh, the Shalom vineyards are among my favorites. I would, mm -hmm. I would rank them highly. They're uh, Pinot Noirs, right? And some Chardonnay uh, that they do? Yes. Oh, delicious. Um, and how about if it's just you and your wife or even you solo, do you treat yourselves from time to time or what does that typically look like? Well, a good question. I would say that uh, it depends on how much time we have. I confess that sometimes our meals are a little hurried and uh, I wouldn't want to waste a very good wine on a hurried meal, but uh, I would say, uh, gee, uh, nothing special. Whatever we have at hand. I'm yeah, pretty Catholic in my taste in that regard. <laughs> Whatever is just in, in the first row, right? <laughs> yes, that's right. And um, it also depends on the cellar. I, I, I don't have a cellar uh, here in uh, South Carolina. Uh, I have a, a wine fridge but I uh, had a cellar up in Massachusetts, which could hold a lot more than I have uh, now. Well, I think the, the humidity would certainly agree with the wines, but I don't know about the heat. <laughs> right. um, so a question that I, I, I'm most curious about is if you, you know, regardless of uh, alive or dead, do you, um, if you could share a bottle with, anyone, any author in your collection, um, who, who would it be and what would you drink? What a wonderful question. What a wonderful question. Uh, I would say that probably Evelyn Waugh, mm. was, whose main opus is not wine writing at all, though his, uh, his brother was a wine critic, but Evelyn Waugh, would be the person I'd most like to share a bottle with. And uh, in Brideshead Revisited, there is a wonderful passage of wine drinking, which I would say is my favorite. Uh, I don't know if that answers the question, but... Uh, would, would you, do you see it being uh, maybe a first growth Bordeaux that you would is that someone you would open? Uh, <laughs> I, I think so. I, yes, yes. I, 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 I confess I'm probably more of a Bordeaux man than a Burgundy man, although I won't turn down a Burgundy either. But uh, I've had a few chances to drink some great Bordeaux that are memorable. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, I, I would be with you there. I mean, I'm, I'm very much a Burgundy person, but some of those best Bordeaux you... It's, it is, um, as you described earlier, that just sort of 
takes you takes you in and puts you in a place and makes you believe that you're walking amongst the vines and yes that's exactly right <laughs> well said well said um so I, are we doing all right on time i have certainly more questions i don't know if there's questions yeah, from the I, I i think we're good uh, i mean and do you think we can keep going with the questions yeah yeah great sure so megan if you got them keep on asking and if anybody in the audience if you guys have any questions for jerry you can uh, message me in the chat um, and I can relay them to Jerry for you. Um, well, the, I guess one of my biggest questions, and maybe this is more time than we have, but, but obviously your collection isn't, it's quite deep, seems like ongoing for a while. Is there, um, is wine something that you've just always been interested in or what really inspired you to, what opened up this, this world for you? I think that uh, it, 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 uh, it took place basically in Italy. Uh, I had a job with a bank in New York, and all of a sudden the bank said, you're single, go to Italy next year. And so they sent me to Italy, and uh, I became uh, infatuated with Italian wines, I learned a bit about wine, and started reading about wine. And uh, I would say that that was the beginning of, of my love of wine. And I started reading about it because I'm a book person and uh, drinking wine wasn't enough. It was reading about it and I built a wine book collection. So I don't know if that answers the question, but. Uh, yeah, I, I think Italy is, um, it's where I fell hardest. I yes. was working at an Italian restaurant in New York and started to discover those wines, and that was the beginning of pretty much my whole wine career. But Great. especially when I first got to visit there, it's it's very easy to to get sucked into that. I think so, and I and without saying anything bad about the French, who are wonderful, I think the Italians are a little more jolly when they drink. Than they drink. <laughs> I think so. Um, so this is kind of, uh, just think, just throw out the first thing that you think of, but I'm curious as to, um, if you were to, just to be a little playful, kind of pair a certain wine with a certain genre of wine book, um, what, what's the first thing that comes to mind that you would want to drink if you're reading a, a, a book on health? Ah, great question. I would say it would have to be red, uh, and it would probably be uh, a Bordeaux, I mm. would say. Uh, it does sound very healthy. I think, what is the, is it the, I, I don't even know the chemical name that uh, is in red wine. It's Revestrol or something like that. I may be messing no, it up. Right. But uh, I think there there may be more of it in 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 red than in white, and maybe more in Bordeaux than in Burgundy. Well, it, it's certainly a very long-lived wine, so it might mm -hmm. you know prove some. If you drink a wine that can age for a hundred plus years, maybe that longevity can transfer. <laughs> yes, let's hope so. Let's hope so. Um, how about if you're reading about philosophy? Does that spark the appetite of something different? I would, I, what wine would I choose reading about philosophy? Uh, I don't know. I would say that uh, it would be red uh, and it would probably be uh, an older wine rather than a younger wine. One that would give you a chance to just muse and think and uh, yeah. rather than something too young and peppy. I would think so. I, it kind of brings Burgundy to mind, like a single yeah. vineyard, something that that does that makes you have to think kind of maybe even a little too hard about it. <laughs> I, I agree. I agree. Well said. <laughs> um, and what about true some wine wine true crime? <laughs> there are several uh, wine true crime stories. I, I don't uh, have my collection in back of me here, but. Uh, 
I have a collection of wine mysteries, and uh, there, there are uh, both true crime and fiction in the genre. Uh, there are different ways of dispatching the corpse. Uh, there are some people who are poisoned, of course, with wine. There are others who are beaten on the head with wine staves from the barrel. That's not very nice. And there was one who was drowned in a vat of wine. We don't know whether the person drowned or just expired because of the carbon dioxide. So wine murder mysteries can be pretty gruesome. <laughs> so that might make you want to reach for the, the gin or the wind. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> I agree. Oh, I love that. Um, well, uh, I guess one other question. You obviously have um, Italy being a, a really important place for your, your love of wine. If you could go anywhere tomorrow without the fear of airline travel, um, is there is there a, a wine region that you would go to? That what, what would be your choice of any place in the world? Well, I think that, uh, of course, the, the great first growth Bordeaux's are unassailable. And uh, if one of the Rothschilds were to ask me into his living room, <laughs> and uh, I wouldn't say no, but uh, I, would, I would probably go with uh, a California wine. Uh, and maybe even surprisingly, a white. Yeah. I mean, it's certainly starting to get pretty hot and humid out. So I feel yes, like it's refreshing. Uh, it's refreshing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, have you have you ever had a chance to meet any of the authors in your collection? I have met uh, a couple of authors, uh, not to uh, have a long conversation with, but just to chat. And um, I found, as one often does, and I hope I'm not offending any authors, that authors write better than they talk. So sometimes I've found that the meeting of an author whose wine books I loved was not quite as good as the writing. But I will still try. Gary, I got um, two, uh, there's two main, a lot of questions just flooded in actually. So you've intrigued a lot of people in this, uh, this Zoom lecture, but um, a few people are asking if you would be able to supply um, the list of books um, that we, we would be able to send out from the speech um, because you mentioned so many, a lot of people are interested about kind of doing their further reading and researching. Um, so maybe that's something afterwards you and uh, we, we can talk and I can, and I'll be able to email that out to everybody who was in attendance. Um, and I've got, I think one, this is the perfect probably ending question um, for a, a great hour lecture. Um, <laughs> your friend Joe Thompson uh, wants to know where, where do you buy your wine locally? So now that we've all heard this, uh, and if we all have, <laughs> anyone has the desire to safely go out and, and purchase and love up and mask up, where would you recommend? Uh, uh, that's, a, that's a great question. I would say I'm fairly Catholic in my purchases, mm -hmm. and I'm always on the lookout for uh, a bottle that might have been overlooked in a mm -hmm. wine shop or even in a grocery store uh, that might be uh, worth buying. Uh, so I won't reveal any more secrets than that. <laughs> that's, a, that's a smart man. <laughs> well, I, I just would like to thank you again for this opportunity um, to, to speak and get to hear you, you and you and your opinions on wine and wine books. Um, it's an amazing lecture. Well, thanks really to amazing. everyone who yeah. listened and thanks to the Library Society always. Thank you, Jerry. So everybody, uh, thank you for joining us. We'll, we'll see you next time. Uh, look for Anne's email tomorrow. We'll be sending out um, some, another, an, some more announcements uh, in the coming week. Um, so be excited and stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>